Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Power Is Now online radio. My name is Eric Lawrence Frazier. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for finding us on Blog Talk Radio. And for those of you who are visiting us on The Power Is Now website, thepowersnow.com, please continue to hang out there for a while and check out the many services and information we have to support you in the goal of buying and investing in real estate. The Power Is Now has just achieved another milestone of 100, actually 1.4 million downloads on the Powers Now Blog Talk Radio. In addition to that, we have the Powers Now Magazine and the Powers Now TV. In fact, for those of you who are listening on Blog Talk Radio and you would like to get additional resources, please go to the Powers Now TV and you can hear and see this interview today. Today we have a special show, the beginning of a series of shows with Michael Krein. Michael is the CEO of Rio Software Solutions, which is a parent company of Rio Genesis, and he's here today to talk about home equity loan uh, resets. In fact, there's a lot happening in the real estate industry, and particularly with loans, and Mike is going to break it down to us. Before we uh, engage Michael, let me just share a little bit about his background. As I mentioned before, he is the CEO of Rio Software Solutions, the parent company of Rio Genesis, which is a real estate organizing platform. And I want to encourage you to check out Rio Genesis. If you're looking to get organized and to take advantage of some of the marketing tools and great information that Michael will be sharing with us uh, through this series. We're going to be doing a series of uh, almost six shows. And so this is the first show of that series. After 30 years, 31 years in the real estate business, Michael was inspired to create the Real Genesis platform by synthesizing this user-friendly software for all real estate companies. Michael also utilizes his experience as a president of the National REO Brokers Association to enhance his understanding of management and leadership. Mr. Krein is also the former owner of Cell State Nevada Real Estate Services and has listed over 25,000 25, folks, single family homes. Michael is currently married with seven children, teaching them the importance of taking action in their lives. And folks, if you've ever sold 25,000 homes, you know how to take action. I'm sure you can share that information with others. Welcome again, Mr. Krein, to The Power Is Now. <laughs> Thank you, Eric, for having me. It's always a pleasure, and I enjoy it. By the way, the twenty-five thousand is when I stopped counting a couple of years before I retired as a broker. So I'm probably higher than that, and that doesn't even count what my retail offices did. That was my stuff, mostly REO that I managed with my own team. But it was a lot of fun, made a lot of money, and had a great time. And it's all about just working smarter, not harder, and doing things that other people don't do, doing something different. And that's what we're going to talk about today. There's an amazing thing coming up. Well, from my perspective, it's amazing because brokers and agents can make a ton of money on it. For a lot of people, it's actually pretty sad. And you kind of feel bad for them, but it's going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. And we don't control the market. We just figure out how to make a buck on it. That's what we do as agents and brokers. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Michael, you bring up uh, a question I have already in that in talking about the great financial crisis that... Uh, really began between 2007 and 2009. We saw the market crash. Uh, prior to that, in 2005, which may have been kind of the peak, and maybe it was 2006, uh, where equity and appreciation was just riding an all-time high, many people were caught by surprise in this because I don't think uh, we would probably see as many HELOCs uh, as we would in a normal market. No, it was 2005, right up through about mid 2007, depending on which market you were in. Some markets crashed in 07, towards the end, some in 08. But it wasn't just, there are two parts to the HELOC issue. One of which is, yes, people were using the houses like ATM machines, okay? And most of those are the ones that have already foreclosed. And that was a big part of the crash. And for those of us doing REO who understood the market, and like I said, you can make more money in a down market, I always have. Uh, yeah, fortunes were made. I mean, I can tell you several agents and brokers just off the top of my head that, you know, had seven figure incomes plus because of it. But what we're talking about here is something a little different. And that is in 04, 05, 06, and right into 07, prices were up so high that most people couldn't qualify for a mortgage. Now, the lending standards were lowered, but to get a lot of people to qualify, what they did is what's known is a first loan with a HELOC, which is a form of second mortgage. If they do it as a straight second mortgage, it's reported in 
it's underwritten differently, but they did the second as a HELOC with the right to record a second. So for all intents and purposes, it's the same thing. Uh, an example of that would be somebody want, couldn't qualify for a house, so they got a first for, let's just call it 100000 to keep the numbers simple on a sales price, even though it was much, much higher than that. They were used in the higher price ranges more. Um, maybe they'd borrow 50000 on a first, and the bank would give them a second in the form of a HELOC for another 40000 So they got their 90% LTV or 95% LTV. But the first carried a regular interest rate and was a regular 30-year AM, but the second was usually done as an interest-only teaser rate for 10 years. So it was not amortizing, so it was interest only, and it was a very low teaser rate. So it made it affordable, and it allowed a lot of people to qualify to purchase a house during that time that normally would not have. The reason that's so important is those HELOC seconds had 10-year calls on them, where at the end of 10 years, they went from interest only at a very low teaser rate to a fully amortizing at a higher, much higher interest rate, and most of them were conjoined to the first loan. So it wasn't a 30-year AM payment like the first was, but now it's 10 years later, and when they convert that HELOC to a fixed, it's on a 20-year AM, so it pays off at the same time, so your payments are even higher. Basically, what you have is over 3.5 million people who are about to get a massive payment shock when they already couldn't afford their house to begin with, and it's already happening. And we're going to go into a lot of details on that, and the fact is, if you're an agent or a broker, you can make a tremendous amount of money off of what's about to happen here. And in some markets, forget just being an agent and making a hell of an income. As a broker in certain markets where these are really prevalent, you could build an entire office around just this concept. I mean, that's part of what we want to do during this Real Estate Success Month. We're going to give you five different ways to make a ton of money doing things that the other agents don't know about and aren't going after. I mean, these are a lot of things that I teach the NRBA members regularly. It's why they're so successful. Mike, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Real Estate Success Month. I forgot to mention it at the beginning of this show. Folks, we are celebrating really a new year and Michael has agreed to provide great information to help real estate professionals improve their business. And this series of shows is all part of our Real Estate Success Month here in the month of March. And so, Thank you again, Michael, for taking time uh, to share this information. This is information that uh, would normally be received by uh, the elite in the business who are members of the National REO uh, Brokers Association, which you are the president. And so we feel honored and privileged to uh, be able to receive this information. And hopefully everyone listening and watching will take action on it. Now, you've just shared uh, some pretty big, amazing numbers, and you've explained exactly how we are at this point with so many HELOCs uh, going into default and the opportunity it represents for real estate professionals and then the unfortunate challenge that it represents for consumers. Folks, hang in there with us. When we come back, we're going to dive into the details. Please go to thepowersnow.com and look under television, TV, and you can find the full PowerPoint presentation of which Mike is presenting today. Hang in there, we'll be right back, right after this commercial break. I don't really remember the first time I dreamed about owning my own home. Do you? Take a second and think about your oldest memory, walking through a house and being able to call it your own. Your favorite music playing in the background. Your family and loved ones around you and you're all celebrating. The American dream lives on. The power is now Buyer's Club. Not having enough money is no longer an excuse. Saving up and waiting is no longer an option. We have access to lenders who are willing to give you a leg up when others are not. Though it may seem like it, not every lender is the same. The power is now and it's yours to buy. We'd like to be there for you. Find us at thepowersnow.com and own your home today. And we're back. For those of you just joining us, welcome to The Power Is Now Online Radio and The Power Is Now TV. We are speaking to Michael Crime, who is Dr. Michael Crime, by the way, president of Real Solutions, a parent company of Real Genesis, an organizing real estate platform. Please check it out. Michael today is talking about HELOCs. They're resetting. Home equity lines of credit, they are resetting in a major way. And we're going to get into the details 
of why and how and what the opportunity represents for real estate professionals. This is the first of several shows that Mike will be uh, conducting on the Powers Now, part of the Real Estate Success Month here in the month of March. Thank you again, Michael, for joining us today. Let's get right to it. Home equity lines of credit, man. They are resetting and it is creating a challenge for consumers, but an opportunity for real estate professionals. It's a phenomenal opportunity for real estate professionals. And this is going to be a little tricky and I need everybody to really pay careful attention. I have to explain to you all what's going on, why it's happening, and then I'll explain the opportunity for you as agents and brokers. And you can, you're going to make a tremendous amount of money with this if you're a smart agent or broker and pay attention. And at the end, I'll tell you how to make a lot of money with it. So you kind of have to stay with me as I go through this or it won't make sense. At the same time, uh, I know, Eric, your people are going to be cutting some of the PowerPoint slides in, but we are limited with time on the radio show. So there is going to be the full version of this all laid out with all the slides, all the data, all the how-tos will be up on freebrokerschool.com. So if this is something you want to pursue and you can make a lot of money with it, especially in certain markets, like I said, you can build a whole office around it, um, you'll be able to take a look at the entire presentation there. So I've got to glance over certain items here just because of time constraints, but I want everybody to know it is available for them, all right? One of the nice things about being a retired broker is I don't compete with anybody, I don't worry about competing, so I can tell everybody things that I normally wouldn't, and that's kind of it. So I want to differentiate regular HELOCs from people who just cashed out the houses as a, like ATMs during the boom. Those people have already been foreclosed on. What happened between, and it's very important to understand the timelines, is between 2005 and 2007, when prices were going insane, the affordability index dropped to 19%, meaning only 19% of the average people could buy the average priced house. Banks found more and more creative ways to lend them money and give money away. One of which, to get people to qualify, was to do a first and second together on the purchase. So it was a purchase money loan. It's not like they took a second later. What they did is they got a first at a regular 30-year interest, 30 year amortization and interest rate, and then they were given a HELOC second, which was interest only at a very low teaser interest rate for 10 years. So it made the payments affordable and that's how they got them to qualify. So what happened is you have all of these people and there's well over 3 million of them from 05, 06, 07 who got their home on one of these programs where first and a HELOC were put together. It gave them very low payments for 10 years. However, as of January of 2015, the first of them started to reset. Meaning, and it's very important you understand this, it was massive payment shock for these people because the first stayed the same rate. It was a fully amortized 30 year loan at market rate. Maybe it was five to 6% during that time. The second was an interest only and it was a teaser rate of only a few percent. Well, once that loan reset at 10 years and they started to reset and they'll be a wave of these resetting over the next three years is that second, which might've been half the loan, it might've been 50% and a 45% second. Some of them were quite severe. That loan not only goes up to an above market interest rates and some of them are six and 7%, but it goes fully amortizing to coordinate with the first mortgage. So they pay off at the same time, which means you have half your loan at a 30 year fixed when that HELOC resets, it goes to an above market interest rate on a 20 year amortization to match up to the first loan. So the payments are incredibly high. We've seen people whose payments were $2,400 and now they're $3,900. Okay. And some of the reports will say the average payment only went up $200. Yeah. Wow. When you average it out, but those aren't the people in trouble. Okay. And we've got to remember averages and modes. What's the most common and what's the average? Well, certain numbers skew them. So it's a lot scarier than people are thinking. And, it's kind of being kicked under the carpet here. Nobody really wants to talk about it. But the banks are highly at risk on these, so much so, uh, I've got a friend of mine with a 60-person law firm that does a lot of this. He's got banks that are actually forgiving the seconds rather than carry them on their books. That's an important thing to know because we're going to talk about short sales and because, oh, short sales are difficult. This will be the easiest short sale you ever did in your life. They want these loans gone. Now, Michael, you mentioned that some banks are forgiven these loans. And I'm wondering, how does a, con a consumer take advantage of something like that? Or is it just the luck of the draw that the bank just chose your loan to say, you know, to forgive it and, and, and not worry about collecting at all? First off, that's a, rare, a very rare occurrence, and there's no way to figure out whether you qualify for that or not. 
unless you're in default on your loan, in which case they may come to you with an offer and a loan mod and forgive the second. It's a very rare occurrence. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason I brought it up is it tells you how severe these HELOC seconds are and how badly the banks want them off their books. Now, Mike, do you think this could bring another uh, maybe mini crisis with the amount? I mean, 3.2, 3.5 million HELOCs resetting. It seems like we have another crisis perhaps underway. We have another crisis underway regardless of the HELOCs. This is just going to make it worse. Mm. So President Obama in his State of the Union address this year said anybody who said the economy wasn't recovering and continued to recovery was speaking fiction. Well, apparently I'm going to give a lot of fiction because I don't think it's out there and we're going to have another crisis and another drop in homes. And this is going to be one part of it. What was also interesting is there was no mention of the housing markets during the State of the Union address or any solutions for it. So we're not going to get any government help here either. That's my take on that. I think it's important to understand you're in an election year. They're going to kick this can down the road and whoever inherits the White House is going to inherit this problem. But we do have another market correction coming. Will it be as severe as 2008? I don't think so, but it's got the possibility of getting real close. So that's something everyone out there in this industry had better be prepared for. We're going to have another downturn in the markets. This is just one contributing factor, and it's a very large one. Um, going back to your other question, why would banks you know, forgive seconds and take them off their books? That requires about a two-hour lesson in banking regulations and how banks make profit, and then another lesson on money creation and capital reserves and leverage. Needless to say, it is incredibly expensive and costly for the banks to carry these seconds on their books. It has to do with set-asides and reserve requirements and the way banks lend. Just understand that a bank is basically a highly leveraged casino, and you remove that leverage, you remove their profits. So carrying a $40,000 or $400,000 second on their books may require a set-aside that costs them $2 million in lost income somewhere else. That's the simple short explanation. Just understand they, they don't want these. So talking about how many of them, well, let's get into the reason of what's about to occur. So you have all these people suffering massive payment shock when they were just getting by to begin with. You've had no real job growth. I don't care what the numbers are saying. The job growth, oh yeah, we created all these jobs. Yeah, well, they neglect the fact that our population and youth entering the workforce has increased much more than that. So there's really no job growth and wages have not increased in 10 years. So you have over 3 million people barely getting by paying their mortgage payment and their payments in some cases are going to double on them. That's problem number one. Now, you all remember from 2008 through 2000, right up to 2011, people were doing what's known as a strategic default. Hey, I'm so underwater on this house, I'm just walking away. Right. And you know what? A lot of them were smart to do it. I don't want to encourage a strategic default, but you know what? Sometimes it's just smart. And they did. They, they rented for a couple of years, got their credit, and now they're known as the boomerang buyers. They're back buying again. Well, that whole cycle is going to continue because of these, but it's actually a little worse. Uh, I'm going to go into the numbers a little bit, and then I will go into what the reasoning is and why this is occurring. But I just want you to know, this is an untapped market for agents and brokers. It's going to drastically increase the REO for REO brokers. And if you want to learn how to do REO, you go to nrba.com, you join the group because we teach that over there. So I'm going to stay away from the REO aspect today, but this alone is going to create at least a million, million plus REOs the next two, three years, so that's okay. The HELOCs that are out there, and please understand whenever you look at pub that they are greatly manipulated depending on the author's point of view. So these numbers, and I wanna thank Realty Track for this because they were the ones who provided this. Okay, and the numbers are quite good. But there's 3,262,000 plus HELOCs out there originating from 05 to 08 that will be resetting over the next few years. So you've got people who can't make their payments as it is or struggling and their payment, they're going into payment shock. That's part one. All right. Total value of those is about $158 billion. Wow. Massive. People don't realize how large this is. $158 okay. billion. That's these, incredible. Yeah. These are still open and they're in the process of resetting. Now, 1.8 million plus of those, about 56%, are on residential properties that are seriously underwater meaning the combined loan to value is over 125%, okay? These people cannot refinance. They weren't eligible for HARP or HAMP or any of the programs. They're still there, and they're just getting into trouble now. Um, to tell you how severe this is, um, I did talk with uh, one of my clients 
who kind of shared some numbers with me. I can't say who it was, but the loans that reset started resetting January of 2015 by June, the default rate was 9.8% on their portfolio. That's just the beginning. 9.8. Now what's normal in terms of the default rate, Mike? Oh, in the industry wide? Well, it varies based on the market. In a normal stable market, it tends to float just under 3%. But that's a normal stable market. You'll produce about 3% in REO each year. Okay. But when markets are booming, like in 04 and 05, there was no foreclosures that made it to REO because people had equity to sell their way out of their problem. They don't right now. These people have no solution. Can't sell because they're underwater unless they do a short sale. Can't refi. They're screwed. And one of the things you have to remember is that people will always act in their own self-interest. And overall, people are not stupid. They're going to do what's right for them and their family. So that's 1.8 million seriously underwater. But the reality is anybody with less than 10% equity is underwater on that house. Because let's remember, you have cost to sale. You got to pay the broker 6%, title, all the other stuff that goes along with it. And you still need money to move, rent another house or buy another house. Okay. So all of these loans are pretty much underwater as far as I'm concerned. And that difference is going to become really important. So over the next four years, um, these are all scheduled to reset. And we talked about the problems with the cost of sale and that they're all underwater. So we've got Matt, let's look at the logic here. And I want all of you to think what you would do if you were in this situation, because this is how these consumers and these homeowners are going to react. Appreciation has slowed dramatically. When the markets recovered, and over the last couple of years, we had some markets going up 15 and 20%. And these people were massively underwater then. But they kept making their payments because they saw the market was still rising. In other words, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. If I can just hold on and keep making these payments, I'll have some equity back. That light just got blinked out. It's gone. Appreciation, you also saw 2015, appreciation was barely 3%. And even the most optimistic estimates for 2016 are one and a half to three percent. I'm betting right, maybe one percent appreciation. Now think about this. They're still grossly underwater. Their payments just got doubled in some cases, and their house is appreciating more. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. Even under the most optimistic circumstances, if you had three percent appreciation over the next five years, compounded at 15.9 percent. So even if I make these ridiculous payments. Five years from now, I'm still underwater and don't have any equity. What are you going to do? You're going to walk. It's the smart thing to do. Get out of the house, wait two years, start over at current market value, and start building equity immediately. Michael, uh, you bring some very interesting points here, and I'm wondering now, that is a solution for those who you know, are in this situation, but I'm thinking about for those who are not, will this uh, bring a, a problem for existing homeowners who are perhaps not underwater, maybe they're looking to sell. Do we see this dampening of the ability to resell at a, you know, at a profitable rate? Well, again, that's a, yes, it will. That's only going to be one of the factors. Uh, we could do a whole nother show on what's about to occur in 1718 from the high percentage of renters, the, the private equity groups and hedge funds that have bought all these properties that are going to start exiting. We could talk about China. We could talk about all different things. But yes, we are going to have another real estate slowdown and probably a mini crash. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity. So yeah, I think this will affect other homeowners as well. Not that they, if they've got equity, they'll still be able to sell, but they're not going to see the appreciation they're hoping for. Right. So I'm wondering, just from a, a strategic standpoint, as an investor, maybe a homeowner in general, and you're facing retirement in the next 10 years, uh, at some point, uh, liquidation uh, should be part of their plan uh, so they're not hurt as we begin to experience the shocks to our economy. Well, you talk about a couple different things. As far as the seniors about to retire, we're going to do a whole show on seniors because they're 40% of the market in some places. You're right. right. Yeah, that's we're going to do a up. whole show on that. That's, that's a whole other thing you can specialize and build a whole office around. Right. The goal is to give you five different things in one of them. But let's look at it this way. If you live in your home, it's not an investment and you should never look at it as an investment. You're there to raise your kids, be happy. And if you make some equity on it later, great. If you're a real estate investor, I always looked at it this way. I always bought by cash flow. As long as the property cash flows, covers itself, makes me a little money, decent return, I don't care what the market does because I can ride out any market and choose to sell when I feel the market is right to sell. So as, as long as you're buying by cash flow, yes. 
And those investors always do okay, and they're just fine. Through 04, through 07, it was amateur hour, and people were buying based on HPA, home price appreciation curves, and gambling. Okay, real estate market became the largest casino in, on earth. So, so you have to differentiate between a real investor and an amateur, okay? The amateurs, yeah, they're going to get burned bad if they're trying to flip. And right. the flippers are already having trouble. The, the flipping is already way down in most markets. There's just not enough spreads, okay? And would I buy into this market to flip or a short term? No way in hell. I mean, all my stuff is commercial. I just do office buildings and stuff in my portfolio now just because I can hold them forever and it's a lot more stable. Um, but yeah, I think that's going to affect that quite a bit. So the only reason that um, the investors, the private hedge funds are still there buying, and again, the big hedge funds aren't that big a percentage of the market. There's still more mom and pop investors, still 80% of them at least. Um, but they buy by cash flow. So as long as property is cash flowing, they'll be fine. So, but again, conversation, we'll talk about in the wrap up how that's going to affect the market. I'll go back onto this. Okay. So back then to those who have these HELOCs, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is being extinguished and uh, they have very few options. Right. And if they're large, I mean, everybody wants to stay in their home because it's where you raise your kids. But from a logical financial standpoint, most of these people are going to walk. It's just the smart thing to do. And you can't blame them. If I was in that situation, I would too. I'd walk right away. Because there's no point making these ridiculous payments that you can't afford. And in five years from now, you're still not going to have any equity in the house. You're better off walking away, waiting two years, reestablish credit and buying a current market, and then start building some equity from there. So in three years, you can be building equity and have equity in your house again. Or in five years, paying ridiculous payments, still have no equity and be underwater. All right? Most of, you're going to see a huge wave of strategic defaults. They're already starting. So. Oops. We're talking to Michael Krein, who is the president of Real Solutions, and the parent company is uh, Real Genesis, a uh, real estate organizing platform. And Michael is breaking down what's happening in the real estate market, what's on the way for those who have home equity lines of credit. Uh, it's uh, not good news, uh, but it does represent a great opportunity for real estate professionals who want to take their business to the next level uh, to the next level and also to look for other you know profit centers if you will other strategies to improve their bottom line hang in there with us we'll be right back right after this commercial break my name is eric frazier and i'm a mortgage broker and i have a program that can help you buy a home today in fact it's an fha no no that means no money down no closing costs you need to call me if you're serious about buying a home don't procrastinate, don't wait, call today. These programs do not last forever. Interest rates are going up, housing is going higher. The time to buy is today. Apply to buy now. With Eric Frazier, Mortgage Broker. And we're back. For those of you just joining us, welcome to The Power Is Now Online Radio. My name is Eric Frazier, and I'm here with Dr. Michael Krein. He is the CEO of Real Software Solutions, the parent company of Real Genesis, uh, they provide software for banks and financial institutions, and it's, a, it's an incredible company. Mike, you're the founder of uh, Real Genesis, right? Yes, I am. It was all the systems that we'd used in my operations, and we just started building them out. And our main product lines are still for agents and brokers and entire office operations. But along the way, a lot of the banking clients kind of liked what we are. Some of our users were, were well, they kind of liked what they saw that our agents and brokers were using. They kind of asked if we had something for them. So you have a lot of institutional clients on the platform now as well. And there's REO assignments, things like that. But um, let's, let's get back to this because I'm not here to really plug REO as much as I'm to try to teach this. So we'll get there. All right. Absolutely. So All right. we left off with uh, just a, uh, it's, it's going to be a challenging situation with uh, uh, people who have HELOCs right now, they're resetting, they're looking at their payments going up significantly, and uh, really, they just have very few options, do they? They're either going to walk away and be foreclosed on, or they're going to do strategic default and short sale. That's going to happen. The one thing about real estate in particular is you don't ever try to fight a market. You look at the market and say, where are my opportunities? And there's always opportunities. And there's more opportunities in a down market than there are in an up, actually. So everybody listening, stay with me. I know this is a lot of information, but the end, I'm going to tell you how to make a lot of money on this. All right. It's just a great opportunity because these people also have to be incredibly easy to find and get to first. All right. So expect another wave of strategic defaults. Some will go to REO, a good percentage. There will be some banks trying loan mods. 
but that's going to be probably very rare. Dealing with the first and the second, and the way they're structured, they're just not that easy to mod. And even if they do mods, we all know that 65, 70% of loan mods end up going right back into the fold anyway. So don't even let that concern you. Um, a lot of the lenders are going to be suggesting short sales to these borrowers. And the lenders are going to cooperate more so than any other type of short sale. You have to understand this. It's going to be the easiest short sale you ever did because most of these loans are portfolioed where the first and second are still with the same company. So you're not negotiating with multiple places. And because the way they were structured, there's no like MI or PMI insurance on them for the banks to claim either. So they are more motivated to do short sales on these loans than any other type of loan. So it's going to be relatively easy and quick and painless. So it'll be very cooperative. Uh, I'm going to pull up a heat map on my side and I believe you're going to try to edit this in so the audience can see it. Uh, this was provided by Realty Track, and I want to thank them again for the numbers they gave me. And the heat map shows the highest concentrations. In certain areas, if you take a look at this, you can see that there are so many of these that forget just being an agent. You could hire 50 agents and still have plenty of business for everybody. And like I said, these people are easy to get to. We already know they're going to sell that house. So other than that, you just have to show up and say, here, let me help you. It's really all you have to do. But in this heat map, I just want you to know, this only shows the ones that are over 125%, so about half of them. So it looks like there aren't any in certain parts of the country. That's not true. Anybody who's over 90% LTV is highly at risk, and those are all over the country. And I'm going to try and see if I can have those guys cook me up a better map that shows with the rest of them. And if you look at one of the other charts, the, the volume is just staggering. For 2015 alone, there are 890,000 of these resets occurring. These people are gonna be forced either into foreclosure or to sell in most cases. Most people, again, these people did not have a lot of reserves and they were stretched to make these original payments to begin with. This was a teaser qualification for people who couldn't qualify. So very few of these people have the types of careers or have seen an increase in their jobs or their wages have gone up. They probably have, they're still flat. They could barely afford the payment when they first got this loan. The situation is not improved. And if anything, the payment shock is going to wipe them out. So in 2015, over 890,000. This year, in 2016, it's just under a million, these resetting. 2017, almost another million. And even into 18, a little over half a million. So these are going to stretch out because obviously the fault times and everything else. But from now through 2019, this is a great source of business. You just have to find them and they're easy to find. That's what's really neat about this. Remember in our previous show, we were talking about using technology to become much more efficient and make a lot more money? Yes. Okay. Part of using technology isn't having like a platform such as mine, which, you know, that manages the office you follow up and makes it easier, but searching and the access to information we have through technology and what you can do with Google, okay, these, these people are easy to find. I'm going to show you how to find them. That's what I mean about agents using technology. It's not like a specific real estate software. It's just what's already out there. Okay. They have got to adapt to technology. The consumers already have. So, but just the numbers are massive. Michael, uh, a quick question here in regard to these numbers. Uh, going back to the heat uh, map, you're saying this uh, shows the, where the con concentration is of, of HELOCs that are going into default, but therefore 125%. Uh, loan to value and higher, or combined loan to value and higher. So uh, these numbers are really staggering when you do take in consideration uh, anyone at 90%, uh, perhaps even at 80%, if we see that prices will start to decline as real estate, uh, as hedge funds and, and, and other, others just enter into the market to try to unload some of this uh, that they purchased uh, over the last few years. Yeah, the problem's even larger. And that heat map, again, only shows the worst of the worst of the loans. There's twice that many out there. And the other ones are spread out in other areas. But if you also notice where that heat map is, those areas are the ones that had the highest appreciation and where prices went absolutely insane. You got Southern Cal, Phoenix, Vegas, and Florida. Okay, and also the Chicago You're area right. pretty big. So those were the areas that, had, that went up the fastest and crashed the hardest, because that was a ground zero in Vegas. We had the fastest and hardest run up and the fastest and hardest crash. So those areas, yeah, um, but you could go open up a couple offices in those areas, put 50 agents in each and have plenty of these business for them. And again, they're easier to find. And I'm going to get to that at the end. So you just have to understand that most people really are logical. Okay. I mean, we all deal with crazy emotional buyers and sellers, but when it comes down to it, they're going to act in their own self-interest. 
Okay, why do we sell real estate as agents and brokers? Because we want to get paid. I don't know any agent or broker that goes out and sells houses for free. Okay, we want to get paid. We act in our own self-interest. There's, yeah, nothing, right. wrong with, there's nothing wrong with that. No. <clears throat> kind of like, you know, Michael Douglas and Wall Street. Greed is good. It's okay to want to make money. Money is a great thing. I like money. I'm real big on that concept. And if I can help a lot of you listening to this, make a ton of money, God bless you. Be happy. You know, I want to see you have a better life. I want to see you take care of your kids, be able to buy them the things they want, put them through college. God knows. I know how much that costs. Okay. Oh, absolutely. With seven kids, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I still have one in and he's heading off to law school next year. So that's another 300 grand. Okay. And I got two more going yet. No, I want to see you all make as much money as possible because I know what it takes to raise kids, pay them, and you want a nice life. Nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in being successful. So do what you have to do. But the point is, people are logical. They're going to look at this and say, this just isn't worth it. All of these people saw their friends walk away from their houses in 08, 09, 010, and they watched them just walk away or get foreclosed on. They got their cash for keys. But you know what they've also seen? They've seen these same friends of theirs that bailed out back then just bought a brand new house because their credit's been reestablished. They got a nice house. They're building equity. They got a three and a half or 4% interest rate when these people are sitting at fives and sixes plus eights or nines on the seconds. They're going, what am I, stupid? They've already been shown the way and there's no shame in doing it. And so there's nothing to hold them back. That's what we're seeing. So Michael, you're, you're, you're describing an environment uh, that is much different uh, then when, you know, maybe eight years ago when agents are out knocking on doors and trying to convince people to sell and to, you know, uh, short sell and, and everyone was so concerned about their credit. I, I think you're absolutely right that the fear is not there. Nope. The shame is not there. Uh, and people are beginning to see they are logical. They are perhaps more sophisticated today because of what has happened uh, to understand that it's time to you know, move, move forward, especially having the many examples of their friends who did move forward and are back on track, uh, living the good life again, because they were able to make that decision. Correct. And you brought up an interesting point when you mentioned about people who may want to retire in the next 10 years, they're going to be the first ones to do this because here you are, you want to retire. Okay. Your savings have been wiped out. You haven't gotten a raise in 10 years. You're not making any more money. Life is getting harder, not easier. And you're not going to have any equity in your house five years from now when you want to retire. Matter of fact, you're still going to be underwater, never be able to retire. They're probably the first ones who are going to walk. It's just logical. You know, I'm not encouraging strategic defaults. I'm not saying you shouldn't pay your mortgage if you can. I'm just talking about reality and what's going to happen. And I'm not going to judge somebody else for their financial decisions. Everybody has to do what's right for them. Well, I love the quote. Uh, this is your quote, never fight the market. I, that's a great quote, Mike. Um, and I don't know, is that an original? Because it's true. You shouldn't fight the market. You should go with the market and learn from the market. Take advantage of whatever the market is giving you, not trying to create something where there isn't nothing. I mean, only Correct. God can do that, right? <laughs> no, you can't fight a market. Nobody ever has, has been able to. You're not going to. And unfortunately, the biggest mistake I see brokers and agents make, if I had to pick one, Aside from the fact that they won't learn anything new and they won't change because they're just a stubborn group. We all are. I know you're a stubborn guy. So am I. We've known each other long enough. But you kind of have to adapt. But you can't fight a market. You can't. And that's the biggest mistake. Agents and brokers. And it's really not their fault because so much information comes up that is just such, I'm going to say, that's just such BS and warm and fuzzy and everything's lovely and everything's rosy and we're going to have a great year, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So... All the agents and brokers are constantly bombarded with all this false positive information because that's just our industry. Our whole industry is built around that concept. Okay, so I can't blame them for thinking things are going to be great and I don't need to change. I'm telling you, they're not that great. You are going to need to change. And I'm going to try and show you how. You cannot fight a market. And the biggest problem is they stay on, they keep doing the same things they were doing. And then the market changes and they're sitting there like this. And by the time they get to change, the market may have shifted again on them. You have to change before the market and with the market, not wait until you go, oh, damn, I was wrong. It's too late then. Just be open. Try new things. You know, I'm not right 100% of the time, but I don't need to be. Okay? You'll get me right on a couple of things and you can make a ton of money. That's like I said, we talked about, you know, risk of failure. There's no downside. You tried it, didn't work. Okay, move on. You know, <laughs> I don't know why people are so worried about trying new things. 
That's so interesting. You, you only have to be right on a few things to be successful. <laughs> I mean, because you some people think just the opposite. You have to do be right on everything, and you got to do everything. But really, just a few things, do it well, you can be very successful and make a lot of money. If you, you know, we're on a side topic here, but the reality is, I know a lot of really, really wealthy people, and almost every one of them has gone broke three or four times in their life. I've been on the balls of my ass more than once because I take a lot of risk and I push it. You know, you recover, you move on. Okay. I mean, once you hit zero, if you go broke, you can't go below zero. Okay. So you start over. It's okay. But try new things. You'd be surprised. You only need a couple of them to work. All right. And, you know, I love Tom Hopkins. I'm a huge fan of Tom Hopkins. Okay. And I don't remember his quote word for word, but he's right. You're not judged by the number of times you fail. You're judged by the number of times you fail, but get up, keep trying until you succeed. Okay? Once you succeed, nobody cares how many times you failed either. So don't be afraid of it. Go out and try new things. Okay? What's the downside? Who's going to make fun of you? Who cares if they do? Go have fun. There is no downside. There really no. isn't. To trying something new in real estate? No, not at all. Well, Mike, this is really motivating. You are motivating us and educating us at the same time. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, folks, Mike's going to tell us what you need to do to get started. Hang in there with us. We'll be right back right after this commercial break. This is the Power Is Now Radio. We've recently launched the Pen Magazine, and we're looking for contributors. The good news is you don't have to be a real estate agent or even in the real estate business. We have 22 sections, including art, education, music, politics, entertainment, technology, and many others. If you can write, send us an email at editor at thepowerisnow.com, and let's talk. Live in the present and make it count. The power really is now. And we're back. Welcome again to The Power Is Now online radio. And folks, I've been having an incredible time with Michael Krein, breaking down the opportunity, tremendous opportunity uh, to get involved in helping people who are going to be really trapped if they don't do something. Uh, because of the HELOCs that are resetting, 3.5 million people, $158 billion. And that's just at the 125%, those 125% HELOCs. It doesn't include those who are at 90 or even 80% loan to value, especially if the market corrects itself, which Mike predicts it may do. Uh, it could be far worse than what he's sharing with us today. Michael, this has been a great show so far, and uh, I'm looking forward to show two, three, four, and five, folks. This is just the beginning of a lot more to come. So, Mike, you've got us excited. We know what's going on. What do we do next? All right. Here's the nice thing about short sales. Now, I, as I said, a lot of these properties, these people probably end up as REOs, a good percentage, um, maybe 20, 30 percent. But the rest of them, the nice thing about doing a short sale is it's kind of like assigning yourself your own REO listing. Because if you get to the homeowner first, you have the listing agreement signed. The bank can't tell them they can't use you. You're there. The bank now has to deal with you. So the trick is to get to them first and talk to them. Ask them what they want to do. Um, you should do a little homework. And I'll go into a lot more detail on this on the full um, lesson on free broker school. But you have to tell them about the other options they have as far as how long it takes to get a new mortgage afterwards, how to do credit repair if they need to, some of the different grant programs out there. So you should be a little educated. I'll touch on those when I do the full segment. But if you get to them first, it's very, very easy. And you can do it by phone calling, you can do it by door knocking, or you can send out flyers and mailers. Now, remember, I, one of my common themes here is working smarter, not harder. If you send out 500 mailers, and you get a 1% return you know, looking for listings, which tons of agents and brokers still do. And I'm not against farming. I am against farming stupidly, okay? All right, just sending out to 500 random people, if you have 1% return, you're lucky, maybe get a listing or two out of it. But if you target those mailers specifically to people who have a very high probability of needing to list and sell their house, those numbers can go up to 10, 15, 20%. So send out 500 mailers to get one listing, or send it out to a group where you might get 30 or 40 listings. You understand? Same with the phone calling, same with door knocking. All right? Farming, prospecting are very important. 
just nobody does it efficiently. So you got to get to these people first, and there's several different ways you can approach them. But what you have to do is understand how to find them. And this is where technology comes in. Most of you have MLS and tax records. All right. If you do a search in your tax records, typically in most markets, now everybody's system is different with the way their assessor is. You can search the tax records and it's going to show you when that home was purchased and if it's been transferred. So if you search through the MLS records, tax records, or go to one of the three big title companies, they have phenomenal resources. And until TRID, you know, most of your um, marketing reps and title officers, you know, escrow officers would get this information for you. Unfortunately, some of them are a little leery to give information for free anymore because of the new laws and scrutiny they're under. But talk to your title rep first. Most of them have access to one of the majors can get you this data. If not, search your MLS. If not, search your tax records. But you can find a lot of information there. First of all, you search for homes that were purchased between 2005 and 2007 that have not transferred. So we still have the same owner. When you do that, that will already knock down. If you take a neighborhood of 1,000 homes, that'll probably already bring it down to two or 300. So, because anybody else might have been foreclosed on already, or the house has been sold and somebody else is in there, but just search for purchases that occurred there without a transfer on them. That's part one. Now, depending on your local MLS or your tax records, how they do it, most states have a mortgage tax. And when they do, and even the ones that don't still show it, a lot of times in the tax record, you can see what type of loan. There's a code for how the mortgage tax is paid. Like uh, on my local one, you can see a C. If it was a conventional, you can see an FHA. You can see what type of loan it was. So by searching, I would start just by looking for homes that were purchased between 2005 and 2007, or right up to 2008, depending on when your market turned, because these were still going in 2008. Look for those. That'll cut you down tremendously into the group that you want. And if you can see the mortgage code, whether there is a second mortgage on the house, which you can in some markets, that's your list. That's what you scrape and build your list from. Again, not just using technology. And that's what I said, agents don't understand what they can really do with technology. But if you could take that group and instead of sending out 500 flyers to just random individuals on a 1% return and you target that group specifically, you're gonna hit these people. So maybe your return will be 15 or 20%. You can do the same thing once you find them by door knocking or by cold calling. And you can call them up and just ask them, hey, we're just doing a little survey. Do you still have a HELOC and a second loan on your home that's about to reset? And if they go, yeah, oh my God, poor you. That's how I would start the conversation. After that, it's easy. You all know how to, how to list a house. I'm not going to go into that part of it. Right. But they're very easy to find and target because of technology and the record keeping that's available nowadays. So, the, and remember, these people are probably going to default or sell with or without you. So you might as well be the first one there, okay? And you're literally going to assign yourself your own listing, and they're just so easy to find and identify. But that's just part of it. I mean, there's a little more to it, and there's some scripts and stuff you can do, but you really don't even need any, okay? Just start talking to the people. How badly uh, your payments have gone up? Oh, my God, your payments went up $400? Do you, do you even have any equity in your home? Most homes in your market are going for about 240. Oh my God, you owe 310? You're never getting out of this. We should really sit down and talk about what your options are. Because now you've got all these, it's an easy thing because you don't have to pitch them on it. They, they've, they're gonna decide to do this on their own, with you or without you, but they're easy to find and target. And imagine you're targeting your mailers, your phone calls, your door knocking, where you know 20 to 30% of those that you've identified are gonna sell in the next year or two. After that, then you put it into a drip campaign and just follow up with them. And that's automated. Hell, it's one of the things we do at Rio Genesis. Makes it easy. Just once you enter them, click it, and it sends the campaigns forever. Um, but they're really easy to get to. You know, I can go into a lot more detail on this. And I'm going to put up everything, including the slides and all the numbers, up on Free Broker School for anyone who wants to take a look at it. But um, this is just one way that if you did nothing but focus on this, especially one of the really hot markets, you could probably go out and pick up a couple of listings a week if you just hit this right. So it's a phenomenal opportunity, and those of you listening to this, if, unless you've seen me speak before, because I actually taught this for VRM, I was their keynote this year, and the NRB members obviously were already taught this, um, but most of you have probably not understood how large this is or how easy it's going to be, all right? You, and I got to say one more thing about these listings. You're going to love these listings. Uh, first of all, because the homeowner is not getting anything out of it anyway, it's a short sale, you're not going to have an overpriced listing. They'll list it at whatever it takes to get out of it. Do you have to negotiate a short sale? Yeah, but not like the other ones you've done in the past. These are the easiest short sales. 
Both loans are usually with the same lender. There's no insurance for them to claim. And because the banking reg changed, they want these loans off their books. We've literally seen responses in a week, yeah, get rid of it. So it's just a great way to get some great listing inventory that'll be priced right, that'll be easy to sell. And the nice thing is if you, if you do a good job and stay in touch with the people, and again, this goes to having a good CRM and some software, two years from now, you're probably gonna have another sale out of them because you help them get out of this mess. And the other thing is ask them for referrals. Because guess what? They know everybody else in the neighborhood who's got the same problems. So you can just make, you can create a whole career out of this. Hell, you can build an office around this in some markets. So. You know, Mike, what I, I love the most about what you're saying is the fact that um, it's so easy. You know, first of all, you're providing the information free right here on the Powers Now. And for those who need scripts and additional help and support, they can go to freebrokerschool.com, which is really free. Mm -hmm. Sign up. Yeah. And they'll be able to see this presentation uh, and with even more detail there. And you have the platform, the Real Genesis platform, which is a great uh, opportunity for those who want to get organized in their support and their attack on this market uh, to um, do so in a very effective cost-saving way. And then, uh, I mean, being smart in your marketing, you're not talking about spending thousands of dollars on uh, untargeted, uh, unsophisticated mailing. You're talking about really doing the research and drilling down to a, a few hundred people that you're mailing to where your odds of success are tremendously higher than just a blanket mass mail. I mean, all of this is really simple to implement and it gets get going right away. And I love that about the information you're sharing today. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean about working smarter, not harder. I've seen agents spend all day addressing envelopes, putting mailing programs together, 500. If they just took 15 minutes and sorted out a quality list based on certain criteria, they would quadruple their response. But they'll spend five hours put, stuffing the envelopes, but they won't take 15 minutes to make sure they're going to the right place. Wow. You know, I mean, that's just how it goes sometimes. That's what I mean about working smarter, not harder, and what technology can do. You all have computers, you've got your iPads, you got Google. I mean, Google alone, you can make a career out of, you know, how to search Google people correctly. Especially because everybody tells everybody everything on social media nowadays. That's yeah. so true. <laughs> no, seriously, there's one company I was talking to that actually created some algorithms and they basically just go out all over the web and social media and target people they believe have a high percentage of selling their home this year. And it actually kind of works. There's ways to do that. I mean, it's really kind of funny what could be done with good numbers and data analytics. But what I'm talking about is simple, right? I mean, you've all been taught, go chase FISBOs, go call expireds. Well, FISBOs don't want, to, don't want to use an agent, probably hate agents, which is why they're a FISBO to begin with. Granted, most of them will give up and sell and list within three to four weeks. So most FISBOs do list, but you got 10 other agents calling them. So you're competing against 10 other agents with someone who's already got a bias against you. Expireds? You're right. You know... I've got one property that keeps showing up as expired for some reason, even though I sold it 10 years ago. And I get like six calls a day on a property that I haven't owned in 10 years just because the last listing expired and somehow I still show up as the owner, small office building I had. But everybody's doing that. Do what the other ones aren't doing. And an expired listing was probably overpriced or it would have sold, okay? The homeowner's probably got a bitter taste in his mouth. That's a tough listing presentation. Why go after the hard ones? That's what everybody else does. Okay, go after the easy ones that nobody else knows about. That's how you make money. Okay, and that's where market change is so important. And between the changes in the market, the technology at your fingertips, remember our very first conversation when we started this series of radio shows is we are going to become, within the industry, the haves and the have-nots. You know, nothing complicated. Just a little bit more thought involved, and I think you can make a ton of money, and I'm willing to show you how. And that's kind of one of the funny things about being a retired broker. I can say whatever the hell I want now. And that you do. <laughs> You're listening to Michael Krein, the president of Real Genesis, which is a parent company of Real Solutions. He is the president of the National Association of REO Brokers. And Mike brings, as you can hear and see, for those of you who are watching, a wealth of experience and knowledge and expertise to help you grow your business. This is the first of several shows that we're going to be doing. Today's show was on HELOC resets. 
The information is also available on freebrokerschool.com and on the Powers Now TV for those of you who are listening on Blog Talk Radio. The next show that's coming up is 300,000 on one hour a day listing system. Folks, that is a show, another show you can't miss. Mike, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing you lay off the plan for making 300,000 on one hour a day listing system. <laughs> so thank you again. Any final words or comments before we end this show? Not at all. Um, the 300,000 year on an hour a day actually does work and it works so well that no one will teach it. Again, that goes back to me being retired and not minding anymore what other people know and sharing information. But yeah, that's one of the ones that uh, pretty much no one will ever teach for a lot of reasons, but it does actually work. And it's a lot easier than you think. And I'll walk everybody through it step by step and have some fun with it. So thank you again for having me. I always love doing these shows. And if anybody wants a specific answer or has a question, um, you can call me at my office. Uh, my information is up on RioGenesis.com or pop me an email. My email is up there as well. So you can get all my information for the website and I have no problem answering questions. I like doing it. You know, I'm a big believer in karma and paying it forward. And if I help other people, somehow life works out for me. You're absolutely right. Give and it shall be given unto you. Thank you, Michael, again, for joining us today. I'm looking forward to show number two. Folks, this is a wrap on show number one, HELOC, Resets, our HELOC, again, as Michael Krein calls it. Well, the show would not be possible without the Powers Now team. I want to thank everyone that participates in making all of this possible. And, of course, you, the audience, continue to share the show with everybody you know. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Listen to us on Active Rain. Comment about the show. And let Michael know that you heard him right here on The Power Is Now. Well, remember, we are at our best and we maximize our success when we act now. Thank you for joining. Have an awesome day. See you soon right here on thepowersnow.com.